All right, this is Pathways 4.39. Use Table 4.1 to determine which combinations yields a precipitation reaction. All right, so we're getting in to predicting products of precipitation reactions with this one. The reactions are written out in words. We've got to convert them to chemical equations, which is going to be one of our first things. And then we've got to learn how to predict whether a precipitation reaction will occur. And write the products of that reaction, write a total ionic equation, and write a net ionic equation. These are actually all key learning objectives for this portion of this chapter. Okay, everybody should know how to do this. It turns out it's not terribly difficult to figure this out. You just have to understand how it works and then practice it a little bit. Okay? Alright, so the first equation is this one: calcium nitrate plus sodium chloride. Now, first off, what you need to know about uh, precipitation reactions, all this chemistry is going to occur in the aqueous phase, 100% of it. What we're going to consider is aqueous phase precipitation reactions. So that means it takes place in water, okay? And that's going to be crucial here in a second. Before we get to that, let's write the equation out in um, chemical formula terms, okay? So the first one is calcium nitrate. Calcium is CA. Nitrate, I hope that you remember, is NO3. Calcium has a 2 plus charge. Nitrate is only minus 1. So to make the charges balance, it looks like I need to do this. Okay? Uh, it's going to be AQ, denoting that this is an aqueous phase reaction. Now I'm going to mix that with sodium chloride. Now hopefully everybody knows sodium chloride is formula by now. Just NaCl. Plus 1 and a minus 1. But again, this is aqueous phase chemistry. And that can potentially form some products that we'll talk about here in a second. Okay? <clears throat> now, let's take a look at what's really going on here. Because to understand precipitation reactions, this is crucial. Earlier in the video when I talked about um, different states of matter, I introduced the aqueous phase. Earlier in this chapter, the last chapter, we talked about an aqueous phase. And understanding how the ions behave in the aqueous phase is crucial to understanding these precipitation reactions. Because when we're writing the formula, like, like this, we're, we're kind of inferring that, that these things are paired up as these ions. Now in the solid, they are paired up. But, but the, the situation changes when we put this material into water. Because what happens is the ions separate when the salt dissolves. The ions physically separate from one another. And instead, the ions become surrounded with a lot of water molecules. So I might have a calcium 2 plus that's surrounded with lots of water molecules. I might have a nitrate ion that's surrounded by lots of water molecules, but the ions are, are no longer paired together. They're, they're in the same solution, but, but they're no longer in a crystalline lattice. Same thing goes for NaCl, okay? So any ionic compound that's a strong electrolyte, this occurs. The ions separate, they float around the beaker. So if I take a, a liquid, a water-based solution of sodium chloride, and a water-based solution of calcium nitrate, and I mix them together, all I'm doing is I'm mixing these ions together right, in one big solution. And that's crucial to understand, because what can possibly happen then, if I'm just mixing all these ions up, is that the ions can cross-react. So this positive ion was originally paired with nitrate, but what can possibly happen is that this positive ion now might pair up with the other negative instead. Likewise, this positive, sodium, might pair up with nitrate. They have the opportunity to react with one another because I'm just mixing them together, dumping them into one big mixture, okay? And that's important to understand for the precipitation reactions because the way that we predict products of precipitation reactions is if any possible pair of a positive and negative ion, like a cation and anion, if any, positive, if any possible pair results in a weak electrolyte or a compound that we consider insoluble or sparingly soluble or slightly soluble, if any combination makes something that's insoluble or sparingly soluble, that precipitate will form and we show it in the reaction. Okay? Now the other possibility is, is maybe we mix these ions together and no insoluble compound results. In that case, we'd say there's no reaction. But what's crucial to being able to predict whether a reaction occurs or not 
is the knowledge of the so-called solubility rules. Now this problem refers to uh, table 4.1, which almost certainly, I haven't looked it up, but almost certainly that lists the solubility rules for different compounds. There's a list of rules that you need to know, and, and basically it tells you if something's going to be soluble or insoluble. Okay, so when we're predicting the products of these reactions, we're always on the lookout for compounds which are considered insoluble. If you make something insoluble by virtue of those rules, you can predict that that product will form, a precipitate will form, a reaction will occur. All right, now back to this problem. So it looks like potential products that I need to consider here would be N, A, N, O, 3, or sodium nitrate. This is again still in water, so it's still aqueous, right? So that's this ion paired with this one. Now when I write the formula for this, I write NaNO3, a plus one and a minus one. I don't, I don't care that I've got two copies of this here or one of this. I have to start by writing the formula based on charge balance. And sodium's plus one, nitrate's minus one, so the correct formula is NaNO3. I can balance by putting the numbers out in front if I need to later, but I have to write the correct formula based on charge balance first, okay? So that's one possible product if the ions cross-react in that so-called double displacement type reaction. Now the other possible product would be CaCl2, CaCl2, or this negative anion pairs up with the Ca2+. Plus. Okay, notice that I've again charge balance before I did anything else. When I write formulas, got to charge balance to make the correct formula. These are my possible products for this reaction. Now I have to ask myself, based on the solubility rules, are either of these two possibilities considered insoluble. One of my solubility rules, actually there's several that could apply to this one, but one of them is that sodium salts are always going to be soluble. Likewise, nitrate salts are always soluble. So this one is soluble for sure. And what that means is that those ions are not going to pair up to form something insoluble. They're just going to float around the beaker surrounded by water molecules. Similarly, this calcium chloride, by virtue of the rules, that's also going to be soluble. A lot of chloride salts are soluble, the exceptions being when they're uh, paired up with heavy metals like lead, um, things like that, okay? We'll see that, I think, in the next problem. So both of the products are considered soluble. They're not insoluble, they're soluble, which means that those ions, they just dissolve and float around the beaker, and they don't do anything. So in this particular case, we don't really have any net chemical change. Over here, we just had four different ions floating around in the beaker when they were mixed. And then over here, same thing. There's not been any chemical change. Nothing insoluble has formed. All right, there's just a bunch of ions floating in a beaker. Nothing has changed, okay? So we, we can't really call that a chemical reaction. Nothing has changed. There's no, no chemistry going on there. We just have a mixture. So as a consequence, I would label this first one, no reaction. No reaction has occurred, no net chemical change. All right, let's work part B. Potassium chloride and lead to nitrate. Potassium chloride. Hopefully by this point, we can identify potassium as K, chloride as Cl. Potassium is plus one, chloride is minus one. It's a one to one molar ratio. That works out in the balancing. Now I'm going to combine that with lead to nitrate. This is also aqueous. And error to denote possible chemical change. Now, is this the right formula for lead to nitrate? Take a look at that. The fact that two's in the parentheses tells us that the lead has a two plus charge on the cation. And you remember nitrate is only minus one, so this is in fact not the correct formula. I need to write the correct formula by putting a PB and R3 with parentheses around the nitrate and then a two in the subscript to denote two copies of the nitrate ion for every one copy of the lead. Right, now again, we've got to think about what can possibly occur here and what we've got. I'm going to do this in a slightly different way from the last one that's essentially the same, but I'm going to write it differently so hopefully you understand what's going on here. Now remember, it's all aqueous phase chemistry. If we've got strong electrolytes that dissolve well and hydrate, 
what we really have in solution is a collection of ions that are floating around kind of independently from one another. So for potassium chloride, it really doesn't exist as these ions paired up in a crystal. Once you, once you throw it in solution and it dissolves, the ions separate. And you've got potassium plus one and chloride minus one floating around, both of those floating around in the water. Similar thing happens with this lead nitrate salt. All nitrates are soluble, so all nitrate salts are going to be strong electrolytes. And as a consequence, I've got lead ions floating around in my beaker. And I've also got two copies of my nitrate floating around in the beaker. All right? So hopefully you get an appreciation for what's really going on inside the beaker. I think that's crucial. You just got all these ions mixed together, floating around. They can bump into each other, potentially react, okay? And that's how these precipitation reactions are essentially going to work. Now, same thing we have to consider as last time. These ions can undergo what we call a double displacement reaction, which essentially means that the, the positive and negatives can possibly switch partners now, okay? So what might happen, maybe the chloride and the lead pair up. That's a possibility. Maybe potassium and the nitrate pair up. Also a possibility, okay? So we've got to think about whether any of these potential pairings result in an insoluble compound formation. So the first possibility I'll deal with is potassium. Now if the nitrate pairs up with the potassium, I can make potassium nitrate. Okay, it's K plus one, nitrate minus one, one to one ratio. Now I have to ask myself, is this compound soluble or insoluble? Potassium is a group one metal. Generally speaking, salts of group one metals are always going to be soluble, strong electrolytes. Same thing with nitrate. All nitrate salts are soluble, okay? So this is certainly going to be soluble. So in fact, it's not going to exist as a solid in solution. The, the only thing that's going to happen with those ions is they're just going to keep floating around as aqueous ions, okay? Nothing's going to change with those two. They were aqueous ions before, they're still aqueous ions, okay? And they've got to put a two here just to balance it. Well, I get it, okay? All right, so moving on then. The other possible thing that can occur is these two ions pair up. So if that possibly occurred, what would I do? I'd have it PbCl, okay, lead and chlorine, but I've got to balance the charges, right? So it's Pb2 plus, lead 2 plus, Cl minus 1. So it looks like to write that formula, I need to put a 2 as a subscript, PbCl2. That balances the charges and it makes the correct formula for this potential salt. Now I have to ask myself, okay, if these ions pair up, does that yield something that's considered insoluble? And for the first time in this problem, the answer is yes. Okay, if you look at the solubility rules, you will read that chloride salts of lead, in general, chloride salts of heavy metals, are insoluble, sparingly soluble, okay? So as a result, if you pair up these ions or give the, the potential or the ability for those two ions to pair up in solution, they will, and they'll form an insoluble precipitate. That precipitate will form in solution through a precipitation reaction. It's a solid the solution will become cloudy. You can filter off that solid, okay? But this works to form a precipitate. Okay? because the compound is considered insoluble. So that's the condition that has to be met. That's why you have to know the solubility rules. All right, so this one will be a reaction. We're going to form the solid precipitate of the lead chloride. So hopefully, you gain an appreciation for how that works through this sample problem. Always need to be on the lookout for solid precipitates, which are insoluble. If you form one, there is a net reaction. Okay. So what I just wrote right here, as you could call it a total or complete ionic equation. I guess we can make sure it's balanced right now. It probably is not, because what do I need to do? I probably need to put a two here to 
to balance the chloride, and this needs to be two, so in the overall one here, I'd have a two out as well, okay? Um, so that'll balance my chloride. Looks like my lead is good, my nitrate is good, and my potassium, this needs to be two here, okay? But this would be a complete ionic equation for this particular reaction, okay? It describes all of the ions that are present listed in their ion forms, if, if that's appropriate. The only one that's not appropriate is this last one, because remember, if you make a sparingly soluble or insoluble compound, that precipitate is the ions which are paired up again to form that crystalline 3D lattice. Those are not existing as ions floating around solution. You can get salt instead, okay? So it's more appropriate to list that as a solid on the far right there. This is our complete ionic equation. Now, oftentimes you're asked to write what's called the net ionic equation. And I want to tell, tell you how to do that real fast. What is the net ionic equation for this precipitation reaction? Well, the net ionic equation, all that is, is the bare bones description of what's going on in a reaction. It eliminates ions which are said to be spectator ions. Okay, now think about a spectator at a sporting event. What is that, right? It's a person that's not participating in the game, right? Maybe you go and you watch the game, but you're not necessarily out there on the court or out there on the field or, uh, participating, right? So the net ionic equation eliminates those spectators. The spectators are the ions which remain unchanged on both sides of the arrow. So they're the same before the reaction as they are after the reaction. So take a look at potassium. I've got two potassium aqueous ions here. I also have two over there. That's an example of a spectator ion here. Spectator ions never appear in the net ionic equation. They will appear in the complete ionic equation, but they do not appear in the net ionic equation. What is another spectator ion? I think we should find one more, right? Is lead a spectator? No, that one changes form. Same thing with the chloride. Here it was CO minus, but now it's paired up in salt. So neither one of those are spectators. But what about this nitrate? Two nitrate before, two nitrate after. Yep, that's a spectator ion. That is a spectator ion not going to appear in our net ion equation. So once you eliminate all the spectators that do not change, you can bring down everything else. So our net ionic equation for this one would be PD2 plus aqueous combining with two Cl minus aqueous to yield PbCl2 solid. And that's our net ionic equation. Notice that it's very useful because it describes exactly what happened in the reaction. Here, lead ions combine with chloride ions to form an insoluble salt. That is specifically the chemistry that occurred. The total ionic equation considers everything that's present, but it provides some extra information that doesn't necessarily get down to the brass tacks of uh, you know, what's occurred chemically. Okay? So this is a nice problem because it shows how to predict products of precipitation reaction. This is a skill each and every one of you will need to know before you go into your exam on this topic.